There are many ways to make a strength build in Elden Ring. You can go full dual wield colossal hammers. You can go caster with some bestial incantations. Or you can go with a tried and true guts build. All of this is good. I personally have found that strength in Elden Ring has a lot of variety. Thanks to the combination of the affinity system and the vast amount of weapons, I have found that it is possible to be prepared for many different situations with just one build. And thus, Sumber was born. This is a warrior toolbox build with the ability to adapt to almost any encounter that the game can throw at you. Large enemies, quick enemies, ranged enemies, flying enemies, groups of enemies, and more. This build has an answer. But not only that, with just the right amount of faith, we are able to increase both our defense and our damage. This is a true Swiss Army knife. As always, we will review the stats of this build, the equipment that we use, and of course its applications within the game. Since there is a lot of ground to cover, I have created timestamps in the description of this video in order to make it easier to navigate the content and give you the opportunity to skip straight to the part that interests you the most. Let's get started. This is a PvE focus build that works wonders in solo play and can even add some spice to any group in jolly cooperation. Our main objective is to deal damage and to create opportunities for further carnage. We aim to combine large static damage numbers with additional damage over time conditions, which will help us make sure that even in between our attacks, the enemy's HP continues to drop. But of course, we are not foolish. We do this with our own well-being in mind by having access to a large amount of HP and strong damage negations. Remember, we cannot deal any damage if we are dead. All in all, we look to stick to the enemy and maintain a constant offensive with no downtime. Fearlessness is your best weapon. To reach these objectives, we will be running the following stats. Start the game as a vagabond. This class is the most efficient to reach the required stat block for this build, allowing us to make use of every rune level possible to its maximum potential. As the primary focus of this build is PvE, I have chosen to base it on rune level 150. Finally, this is a stats block that you want to end up with. 60 Vigor, 24 Mind, 18 Endurance, 80 Strength, 14 Dexterity, 9 Intelligence, 17 Faith, 7 Arcane. There are many ways to reach these stats. Level up however you feel comfortable. That said, I do recommend that you take the following path. As soon as you are in the lands between, the first thing to do is to get your vigor to 20. Survivability is more important than damage when you are just starting out a character. The second priority is to get the stats to wield the golden halberd dropped by the tree sentinel at the beginning of the game. This means 20 strength, 14 dexterity and 12 faith. At this point, you will be forced to use the Halver with both hands. The Golden Halver will carry us throughout the game as we level up our character. With your health in good standing and your weapon dealing the damage, the third priority is to get Endurance to 18. This will help you with wearing heavier armor which will in turn increase your defense. Now, it's time to bulk up and the fourth priority is Vigor to 40. This will allow you to survive comfortably throughout the mid-game, allowing you to focus on your other stats. The fifth priority is Strength to 55. This is the first soft cap for the stat and it will greatly increase our damage scaling with the Golden Halver or any other strength-based weapon that you wish to use. The sixth priority is to top off Vigor at 60. This will put you at our required HP pool, granting you maximum security. Next up, we put the final touches on Faith and bring it to 17. This will grant us access to the last few offensive-based incantations that we are looking for. For your 8th priority, bring mine to 24. Now, we will have a very healthy FP pool that will serve us well in order to increase our damage through more frequent use of Ashes of War and incantations. Finally, we finish up Strength at 80 reaching the next soft cap of the skill in order to obtain the most scaling possible with our weapons. So, why do we use these final stats? Allow me to explain. 
Vigor at 60 because I believe it is the perfect amount of health to survive the hardest hitting attacks of PvE. This will give you a total of 1,900 base HP. It is the second cap for the stat. Going any higher really diminishes your returns. And honestly, I would never go any lower. Mind at 24 because a lot of our damage consists on Ashes of War and offensive incantations. This means that the more mind we have, the more damage we can deal. After I had all the other stats min-maxed, every single remaining point went into this skill. Endurance at 18 because it is exactly the amount that I need to be able to use my favorite weapons and armor while maintaining a medium load. This has been perfectly min-maxed to the last decimal. Any lower and you lose the build any higher and you're wasting points. Strength at 80 because it is the final soft cap of the stat and it allows us to get a really good return in damage with the weapons that we use when taking into consideration the investment that we make. This is our primary offensive stat. Going above 80 is generally not worth it as the scaling we get for those levels is very low. Dexterity at 14 because it is what we need in order to meet the requirements for a few key weapons that give this build additional versatility. Intelligence at 9 because it is the base level of the Vagabond. We do not increase it at all in this build. Faith at 17 because it is the minimum that we need in order to use all of the incantations that power up this build. This level is also perfect to get multiple support spells and a few offensive tools. Finally, Arcane at 7 because it is the base level of the Vagabond. We do not increase it at all in this build. Moving on to the equipment, this is the basic layout of the build. Starting with the main hand, I am using a Heavy Claymore plus 25 alongside a Fire Misery Cord plus 25. When it comes to iconic weapons that will never let you down, the Claymore is one of the top favorites in any Souls games that you play and for good reason. It has good AR, not the highest, but very competent. What it does excel at is its moveset. The R2s of this weapon, both one-handed and two-handed, are perfectly designed thrusts that provide large damage, large range, and a lot of stability damage to the enemies. You will be able to outrange, outpoke, and outmaneuver most enemies in the game. It is the most versatile weapon that I can think of and it will always give you results. You cannot go wrong with it and I run it religiously on this build. As for its Ash of War, I chose to stick to Lion's Claw. This Ash gives us really good damage. It also knocks most enemies down into the floor, which creates time and space to deal even more damage as they stand up. Finally, this Ash has a lot of poise or hyper armor during its traveling leap. I will be honest, to this day, I have never been hit out of the leap. I am sure that there are some moves that beat it, but I have not found them yet. The Fire Misery Core plus 25 provides this build with great burst damage. Whenever you are sneaking up on an enemy or getting a critical hit after a stance break, soft swap to this monster for incredible critical damage. I use the fire affinity on it because it has generally provided me with more damage than the heavy affinity. But regardless, keep bringing it out on each critical hit and you will notice the difference. As for its Ash of War, I use Bloodhound Step. Generally speaking, I do not use this Ash in battle. That said, it is very useful to make a quick escape in a moment of trouble, to dodge any particularly deadly attacks, and to traverse difficult terrain like lava or rot lakes. All in all, it is an extremely useful support tool for PvE, and it would be foolish to not have it in your back pocket. In the offhand, I run the Frenzied Flame Seal plus 9 for my incantations, and a Heavy Longsword plus 25. In regards to the seal, this is the perfect one for this build for two reasons. First, it has no weight. With 0.0, .0 units of weight, it does not increase our equip burden at all. Now, it is true that with our current stats, this seal will have very low incantation scaling. I can tell you right now that this is mostly irrelevant. 
only one of the incantations that we use takes advantage of scaling and even still we do not care about that as we are only interested in the secondary effect of that spell. Second, it has no stat requirements. This means that any character with any build and any starting class can use it without any skill point investment. When it comes to min-maxing for this build, the Frenzied Flame is the best seal that we can use. As for the Heavy Longsword plus 25, I like to keep it in my offhand for two reasons. First, I like to put the Golden Bow Ash of War on it so I can always have access to a good buff whenever I need it. Also, its quick slashing attacks are a good complement to the slower moveset of the Claymore. Sometimes I need a quick attack to create some space. With this setup, it is only a single L1 away. On a lesser note, when I two-hand my Claymore with the longsword in my offhand, the weapon goes into the sheath, at my waist, and that looks incredibly cool. Now, before we move on to the talismans and the armor that this build uses, I want to touch on the different weapons that can be used as alternatives in this build. Sometimes you need a different weapon, and other times there are just other weapons that you, my dear viewer, may like more than the Claymore that I use. For this reason, I have made sure that there are always a handful of options ready and available to take care of any situation that the game throws at you. To the right of the screen, I will show you the weapons on the main hand. To the left of the screen, I will show you the weapons on the off hand. Let's go over some of the different setups that this build can take advantage of. The first alternative is the Heavy Iron Greatsword plus 25 with Lion's Claw and the Fire Misery Cord plus 25 with Bloodhound Step in the main hand, alongside the Frenzied Flame Seal plus 9 and a Heavy Dagger plus 25 with Golden Bow in the off hand. This setup trades more damage for a worse moveset. The Iron Greatsword provides about 50 more AR than the Claymore, but it loses the sweet R2 pokes. It otherwise works the exact same way as the basic setup. Is this better? Well, that is left to your own personal preference. The second alternative is the heavy Great Mace plus 25 with Prayerful Strike and the Fire Misery Core plus 25 with Bloodhound Step in the main hand, alongside the Frenzied Flame Seal plus 9 and a Heavy Dagger plus 25 with Golden Bow in the off hand. The main attraction of this setup is the strike damage of the Great Mace. It is very useful for enemies like Skeletons or Crystallians that are very weak to this type of damage. Also, the Prayerful Strike Ash gives you a good way to recover health while dealing damage, so it is a good support skill for very aggressive players. The third alternative is the Heavy Knight Rider Glaive plus 25 with Black Flame Tornado and the Fire Misery Core plus 25 with Bloodhound Step in the main hand, alongside the Frenzied Flame Seal plus 9 and the Heavy Dagger plus 25 with Golden Bow on the off hand. This setup brings the fantastic moveset of the Halberd that really helps with crowd control and range. If I know I will be fighting a large group of enemies, I bring this out. The combination of sweeping attacks with thrusts makes it an amazing choice. The Ash Black Flame Tornado also helps with crowd control and enemies that have large health pools. The fourth alternative is the Heavy Flamberge plus 25 with Double Slash and the Fire Mystery Cord plus 25 with Bloodhound Step in the main hand, along the Frenzied Flame Seal plus 9 and the Heavy Longsword plus 25 with Golden Bow in the off hand. This is the Bleed setup, combining the Flamberge innate bleed effect with the multi-hitting Ash of Double Slash on top of the damage over time effect from Black Flame Blade, this setup has great potential for massive damage. Also, the Flamberge has the standard Greatsword moveset and that is never a bad thing. The fifth alternative is a Heavy Pike plus 25 with Sword Dance in the main hand alongside another Heavy Pike plus 25 with Golden Bow and the Frenzied Flame Seal plus 9 in the off hand. 
This is the dual wheel spear setup and it is absolutely criminal. Pikes have incredible range and the dual wheel spear moves it, it's just too good. On top of this, the Sword Dance Ash is tremendous with this weapon thanks to its gigantic reach. This setup is perfect for both crowd control and single target elimination. These have just been a few examples of alternatives that this build supports. You can switch back and forth between any of them, depending on the situation or the enemy that you are fighting. No need to change armor or talismans. No need to respec. Just switch out the weapons and your build will evolve. This allows us to adapt to most situations and come out successful from any battle. With our weapons out of the way, now we get to talk about talismans. This build is a melee DPS type, meaning that our main objective is to deal as much damage as possible. That said, we will always be near the enemy and that puts us in danger. For this reason, we also want to increase our HP and damage absorption. As such, the first three talismans that we will be using are the Earth Tree Favor Plus 2 for additional health, stamina and equip load, the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman for a significant damage negation boost, and the Crimson Amber Medallion Plus 2 for a significant HP boost. The final talisman is the Shard of Alexander. This talisman is very important because it increases the damage that all Ashes of War deal by 15%. Since Ashes of War are one of our strongest sources of damage, having this talisman equipped is a huge boon to the build. With these talismans active, we will be running a total of 2134 HP with 40% base physical damage absorption and a consistent power up to any Ash of War that we choose to use. Moving on, let's talk about armor. In this game, armor is extremely important. This is because this game has extremely good looking armor. Fashion Souls or Elden Bling, however you prefer to call it, is at an all time high. For this build, I wanted to go for a standard Dark Knight look. So the Cavalry Knight set was the perfect choice. I am using the chest, arms and legs of this set in combination with the Bandit Mask. In this case, I chose to wear the armor without a cape. Honestly, the build is extremely min-max to work without the cape, so if you choose to use it, you might have to lower your equip burden by changing some of the weapons in the setups. In any case, this look is very generic, but I am happy with what it provides to the build. Nevertheless, my dear viewer, please remember that armor choice is personal and do not forget to use whatever you prefer. If you choose lighter armor, you will have a few extra points in endurance that you won't need, so you can put them in another stat. Or maybe you can use heavier weapons. Do not forget to experiment. In any case, this armor setup alongside the Dragon Crest Great Shield Talisman provides us a very durable 40% base physical damage negation and a total of 33 poise. The damage absorption is good, but the poise is a bit lacking. It won't really matter in PvE, but be careful if you choose to take this build into PvP. Next up, I want to go over the consumable items and the summon that I prefer to use with this build in order to support it and to increase its strength. In regards to consumables, I keep sleeping pots and freezing pots for my throne items, with fire grease as my main buff although you can use any other grease that you prefer. In Elden Ring, status effects are very powerful. Keeping these items ready allows me to have access to Frostbite and Sleep in order to turn any situation into my favor. The weapon buffs allow me to take advantage on the different enemy weaknesses. I prefer Fire Grease because it stuns and staggers some particularly annoying enemies like dogs and those gigantic flower plants. As for the summon, we are running Black Knife Teach plus 10. I will be honest, I have absolutely no idea how to pronounce her name. If anyone is willing to help me with the correct pronunciation, please let me know the correct way in the comments. For now, I will stick to Teach. Normally, I love to run the Mimic because having access to a copy of your build is very powerful. 
That said, in this case, Black Knife Teach is perfect due to the special characteristics of some of her attacks. Teach is a very fast and nimble summon, capable of dodging many of the enemy's attacks. This makes her durable. But what is most interesting is her Blade of Death attack. Not only does this attack deal heavy damage, but it also inflicts a debuff on the enemy that causes it to lose additional damage over time, on top of having their maximum HP reduced by 10%. This particular effect stacks with the Black Flame Blade debuff that we use, and that creates great synergy between the player and the summon. This setup shines when fighting bosses, as the debuff that Teach and the player apply are based on the enemy's maximum health. So the more HP the boss has, the more damage that we will do. Up to this point, we have spoken about the equipment and the armor. We have talked about offense and defense. As such, there's only one last thing to cover. The incantations that we will use to increase our power. It is amazing to see just how many buffs that we can use with just 17 points of faith. And they all do a great job at increasing our offense, our defense, and our survivability. The only downside is that it is temporary. Learning to manage your incantations and buffs is extremely important. Learning how to use them, when to use them, how long it takes to reapply them, and, of course, which ones go together is extremely important. Let's take a look and understand how these incantations will work. In this build, there are 8 spells that are required in order to get the most out of our faith investment. Since there are 10 spell slots available, you will have 2 additional slots to add whichever spells suit your needs the best. But, for the mandated spells, the list is as follows. Black Flame Blade Flame grant me strength Magic Fortification Flame Fortification Lightning Fortification Divine Fortification Flame Cleanse Me and Heal First up, Black Flame Blade. This is the most important incantation for this build in our bread and butter to increase our damage. This spell gives our weapon additional fire damage as well as a debuff to our enemies with a damage over time effect. This is a very difficult to use incantation, but a very powerful one in the right hands. I go over each and every effect in detail, as well as strategies and how to use it in the next section of the video. There is a timestamp in the description. Second, Flame Grant Me Strength. This is our basic damage buff spell providing us with an additional 20% physical damage and another 20% increase to fire damage. The additional fire damage that we get from incantations and consumables is also affected so the boost from black flame blade and fire grease are also increased by this effect it fits the build perfectly so make sure to have it on as much as possible third we have the resistance crew the quartet of magic Fortification, Flame Fortification, Lightning Fortification, and Divine Fortification is our main tool to counterpick the damage that each of the game's enemies and bosses will do. They provide resistance to magic, fire, lightning, and holy damage respectively. You should always have one of these active if you want to increase your chances of survival. Each of these incantations will leave you with about 50 to 54% non-physical damage absorption against the type that you choose. It is very important to know what you're up against so that you can help yourself survive the battle. Next is Flame Cleanse Me. This is one of the most powerful incantations in the game. It provides a fast, cheap way to get rid of poison and, most importantly, Scarlet Rot. This should always be in your list of spells. At only 12 faith requirement, it is too good to pass up, and there is no reason to not use it in every single build that you make. Finally, Heal. This incantation is the only healing spell that I use. 
That said, due to the low incantation scaling of our seal, it does not really heal very well. Fortunately, we do not need to use this spell to recover health. In fact, I used this spell for one thing and one thing only. To kill revenants. Revenants are one of the most powerful and annoying non-boss type enemy that you can find in the game. They deal incredible amounts of damage and are in constant motion and attack. They teleport around the area and I am sure you know have that one move where they hit you one million times with all of their limbs in succession. It is very difficult to fight them but fortunately if you do not let them get started on their offense they become much easier. In order to achieve this we use heal. Revenants are very weak to holy damage but also they are extremely weak to healing spells. If you cast a healing spell with an AoE and it catches the revenant, they will take damage instead of being healed. The amount of damage they take is always the same, about 60% of their max HP. Two spells will always kill them and since the first spell also staggers them, it is very easy to cast two of them back to back for the kill. Since the damage is always the same, I like to use heal because it costs the least amount of FP out of all the AoE heals. If you execute this strategy correctly, then you will defeat the revenant before it even has a chance to hit you. While this build does not specifically focus on using many buffs, it is impossible to ignore that the faith investment that this build has allows us for some very effective incantations that can handle very different kinds of situations. As such, it is important to know which buffs stack with each other and in which order you should be casting them. In regards to stacking buffs, I have done all the testing with the incantations that this build uses and there are two setups for buffing our character. There is the offensive setup and then there is the defensive setup. In the offensive setup, we stack two buffs together, the Golden Bow Ash of War and the Flame Grant Me Strength incantation. In this setup, you should cast the Golden Bow Ash first, as it lasts 45 seconds, and the Flame Grant Me Strength incantation second, as it lasts 30 seconds. This way, you can maximize the uptime of all the buffs. When using this setup, we get about 25% additional physical damage, about 20% additional fire damage, and a base physical damage absorption of 44%. On the other hand, the defensive setup also allows us to stack two buffs. First, any of the non-physical damage reduction spells, which all last 90 seconds. And second, the Golden Bow Ash of War, which lasts 45 seconds. Once the Golden Bow Ash ends, you can reapply it for another 45 seconds and this second application should last until the end of the Absorption buff. With this setup, we get about 10% additional damage, 44% base physical damage absorption and between 50 to 54% non-physical damage absorption against the element that you choose. One of the most important parts of this build is Black Flame Blade. This is a very unique buff type incantation. It has a quick cast time, a full duration of 7 seconds, and once you apply it to your weapon, it has two effects. A generic and static fire buff is given to your weapon, and also a damage over time effect is given to your enemy's health when they are hit with the weapon. In regards to the fire buff, this incantation gives our weapon an additional fire type AR equal to 0.65, the incantation scaling of the seal that we are using. In this specific case, this buff will give us a total of 77 additional fire AR. In all honesty, this is not a lot. That said, this particular effect is only an added bonus and not the focus of the spell. We are more interested in the damage over time effect. Once you hit an enemy with a weapon that has this buff, their health will begin to tick down. The damage over time effect deals a total of 20 damage plus an additional 20 damage more for each 1000 max HP that the enemy has. 
this damage is dealt throughout a period of 2 seconds. Now, I understand that this damage over time effect might be confusing to fully grasp, so let's go over some examples. If an enemy has less than 1000 max HP, they will only take 20 damage over the 2 seconds. Now, if the enemy has exactly 1000 max HP, they will take the basic 20 damage plus an additional 20 for the total of 40 damage over 2 seconds. Now, let's escalate things a bit more. If the enemy has 10,000 max HP, they will take the basic 20 damage plus an additional 200 for the total of 220 damage over 2 seconds. As you can see, the more HP the enemy has, the more damage this effect deals. If we take an in-game example, Godfrey, the first Elden Lord, one of the last bosses in the game, has a max HP of 21,903. If we were to hit him with a weapon buffed by this incantation, he would take the basic damage of 20, plus an additional 420 damage due to his high amount of total HP. This is a total of 440 damage over the span of 2 seconds. Let me put this into perspective. 440 damage is about 2% of the full 21,903 HP. This means that on top of the damage that you're doing with your weapon, Godfrey would also lose 2% more HP in the next 2 seconds. If you keep applying this debuff by attacking multiple times, then he will lose 2% of his max HP in 2 seconds every single time that you hit him. This might not sound like a lot, but it really adds up. As a strength build, most of the weapons that we use are slow and it takes time to get multiple swings in. This damage over time effect makes sure that the boss's HP continues to go down even while we are preparing for another attack or while we are dodging one of theirs. There is no downtime on damage. The next thing to go over is the stacking of these damage over time effects. As a general rule, you cannot stack the damage over time from Black Flame Blade with another damage over time from Black Flame Blade. In other words, it does not stack with itself. What happens is the following. If you attack an enemy, they will receive the 2 second debuff. If you attack them again before these 2 seconds are done, then the new debuff will replace the existing one starting a brand new 2 second period. For this reason, if you want to take the most advantage of this damage over time, then it is best to plan and space out your hits. On the other hand, the damage over time debuff does stack with the one that Teach uses. This means that the summon can apply her own debuff on top of yours, synergizing together and bringing down the enemy's health at an alarming rate. This is the main reason why we use this summon. The combination is truly deadly. I am sure that by now you, my dear viewer, are asking a very important question. If the buff only lasts 7 seconds, how will I have time to apply it to the enemy more than once? This is actually a very good question. Of course, the short duration of the buff is a problem for its use, but it is not a deal-breaking one. That being said, fixing this issue will require some work, because now we have to do something very important. We have to plan some combos. Indeed, the best way to take the most advantage out of Black Flame Blade is to use it in a combo. Please take a look at this combo that I like to use with the Claymore. This combo works on most non-boss enemies and even on some bosses as well. And if you pull it off, it usually means that the enemy will take a large chunk of damage. The combo string is as follows. You cast Black Flame Blade, you dual wield the Claymore, you execute Lion's Claw, you do a charged R2 and finish with a regular R2. 
If you notice the flames on the weapon, this whole series takes exactly 7 seconds, and I am able to hit an enemy a total of 3 times, applying the debuff each and every time. This means that on top of the 3 hits in the combo, the enemy will be suffering the damage over time effect throughout the whole sequence, as I continuously reapply the debuff multiple times. Now, please take a look at how the combo works on different enemy types. As you can see, Lion's Claw has a lot of poise and hyper armor, meaning that I can push through my enemy's attacks and land the Ash of War. This will knock the enemy down, giving me time and space to set up the Charge R2. While I am charging my second attack, the enemy's health continues to decrease, and as they get up, I connect with the R2, reapplying the debuff for more damage. At this time, most enemies will have their stance broken, so I do a quick swap over to my Misery Cord and finish the job. If for some reason the enemy does not stagger, then I can do the final regular R2 for more damage and another round of the debuff. As you can see, if you plan a sequence and take advantage of your Ashes of War, you can set up plenty of damage opportunities where Black Flame Blade can truly shine. I am not going to lie to you, and I will repeat myself. Black Flame Blade is not an easy to use incantation. It requires timing, enemy knowledge, and good planning. It is also not useful for every enemy, and really shines when fighting bosses with large HP pools. That being said, despite all of its difficulties, it is an extremely good incantation that can put down a lot of damage over time, over the course of a boss battle. It has great synergy with strength builds that have slower attack speeds, letting us take full advantage of the time in between our hits. I can promise you that if you put in the time to learn how it works and practice some combos, it will not only pull its weight, but it will also speed up your battles considerably. In Elden Ring, strength weapons turned out to be very good. Not only that, but the ability to add the heavy affinity to most weapons and obtain good results has led to a very versatile strength build with many options, ready to deal with all of the situations that the game throws at you. Usually, a strength build means using the biggest weapon that you can find and hitting your enemy with it, so I am happy to be able to switch things up a bit with this build. If you like to play melee, but don't want to be locked behind a single weapon, then this build will be a really good fit for you. Not only does it provide high, constant damage, but it also has fairly reliable defensive capabilities. While it is not a tank type build, you will still be able to take a few hits before you go down. This should give you the opportunity to dish out a few more attacks and end up victorious. All in all, this was a really fun build to play and one that I will come back to in the future to do some jolly cooperation. I hope that it serves you as well as it has served me. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope I get to see you on the next one.